These are some plantations in British colonies that operated just 100 years ago. Some of these workers are enslaved Africans. Some are indentured servants from India. Can you tell the difference? After slavery was abolished, Britain replaced its enslaved workers with a cheap alternative, indentured servants. In this new system, millions of people were coerced into signing away their rights for five to 10 years at a time. This system is not ancient history. Some of its survivors could still be alive. These workers became bound to overseas employers where they endured harrowing abuse and exploitation for the duration of their contract. I would call the system of indenture uh, a hidden history and it is and has been deliberately obscured from our national narrative. Maria Kaladin's great-grandfather was recruited from India through this exact system. He ended up toiling at a sugar plantation in British Guyana for years on end. After seeing how her family's past had been buried, Maria decided to specialize in the study of Indian indenture. We know about it because the British kept the receipt. They are there, the, all the receipts are there. They are there for everyone to see. British colonizers took portraits of these workers after taking them from India to work in overseas colonies. Most would never return. Have a look at this record of Indian immigrants. These are the names of Indians who signed an indenture contract and boarded a ship from Calcutta on December 2nd, 1903. There's an agreement between you and your employer that you will work for a particular number of years. As soon as they signed that contract, the indentured worker lost much of their freedom. They were treated like human cargo, shipped around the world and bound to their employer for the time period of their contract. They were bought, sold, overworked and abused in ways far too similar to slavery. Here's how it all went down. By the end of the 1800s, the British Empire was growing to the biggest the world had ever seen and the natural resources of the colonies, like sugar and cotton, earned the colonizers a lot of money. But labor costs started eating into Britain's massive profits after slavery was abolished. And that's when the British brought in indentured Indians. There were more than three million people like Maria's great-grandfather taken from their homes and placed on ships heading to British colonies. The overall trade for these cheap laborers replaced nearly a quarter of the Atlantic slave trade. What has taken place is um, a retelling of the history of the 19th century that focuses on the abolition of the slave trade and lords those involved in the abolition of the slave trade, but does not draw attention in any way to the fact that the system of slavery was replaced by a system which was very brutal, really cruel and lasted into the 20th century. The vast majority of indentured workers were from India. As a result of indenture and additional migration, pockets of the Indian community can now be found in nearly every corner of our globe. Over 32 million people of Indian origin live outside of India today, the world's largest diaspora. India might actually be a kind of replacement for Africa. Think of this from the planter's point of view. They can't imagine a world that would deny them a source of labor, cheap, malleable labor. In 1838, the first Indian indentured laborers arrived in Guyana, and that was really the beginning of the system of Indian indenture. Some laborers were forced or kidnapped, but others signed on voluntarily, especially during famine caused by British colonial rule. But most didn't know what they were signing up for. Picture yourself as Maria's great-grandfather, Kaladin, who was living in Pipra, India. Wages are at an all-time low. The class system is not working in your favor. Famine plagues your village. Recruiters employed by the British boast about the opportunity of indenture, guaranteeing high wages in return for a five-year labor contract. They often frequently lied about what the terms of the indenture contract were the distance of the place that people were traveling to, and the nature of the work that they would have to perform. You can't read or write, but they tell you the contract provides round-trip passage to Calcutta, India, where you put in light labor in exchange for great wealth to bring back to your family. 
Like more than two million other Indians, you stamp your finger and take the deal. In 1886, my great grandfather was recruited in Gonda. He was taken to Faisabad. Then, from then, he was taken to Calcutta as an indentured laborer. What they didn't tell you is you're not really going to Calcutta. You're transferred from depots to shipyards, perhaps told your final destination would be Sri Lanka. But your ocean voyage keeps going and going. The ship itself is rancid, and you are crowded alongside parcels of rice, wheat, and hundreds of other laborers deep within the cargo deck. Your voyage could have been one that was fraught with deaths from cholera, for example, typhoid, dysentery. It would have been quite traumatic for the, um, for the immigrants. You are lucky to survive the diseases that kill roughly one in five of your fellow passengers. Your peers bond over the shared trauma and call themselves the Jahajibai, or Brotherhood of the Boat. Three months later, you arrive in an unfamiliar land, and someone tells you it is known as British Guyana, a British colony thousands of miles away from home. He left Calcutta for Guyana, and he indentured for two periods of five years on two estates in, in Demerara's. This arrival story is way too familiar for the tens of millions of descendants of Indian indenture. Hundreds of thousands of people were taken from China, Japan, and Polynesia as well, forming an extracted community known as Kulis, a term that's now an offensive slur. The laborers were shipped across 19 of Britain's colonies, namely in the Caribbean and South Africa. The Dutch and French also took advantage of the cheap labor for their own plantations. Indentured labor was used to cultivate sugar, cotton, and tea, as well as endless train tracks. As early as the 1840s, British officials were calling this a new system of slavery. The vast majority would never see India again, and would end their lives working in cane fields on the other side of the world. Indentured workers endured backbreaking work and were whipped and abused by white authorities. Many of them were even housed in the same barracks as formerly enslaved people. Indentured women were sexually abused by white overseers and sometimes assigned to an Indian man as his housemate and sexual partner. There is a deliberate kind of denial of anything which does not meet the description of enslaved or free. These binaries are not helpful to people who are trying to express or explain what the system of indenture was. There are conditions of unfree labor that exist between these two states, and we must look at them, we must see them, they're part of our history. And what happened when their indenture contracts ended? You could then choose to accept a return voyage home to India, or you could again um, accept a further bounty and stay in the colony. And that's what the majority of people Ch chose to do. But why would anyone choose to remain indentured? Even after years of laboring, some people didn't earn enough money to bring back home. Others feared they would be shunned when they got back to India, accused of abandoning their family. So from India, people were taken to Mauritius, to Trinidad, to Guyana, to Fiji, to St. Lucia, Grenada, South Africa, Malaysia. The system was huge. So over two million people uh, were part of it. And it has left, obviously, a, a huge diaspora because the majority of people didn't return in those places. They are a remarkable people because the, the story of indenture is a story of against all odds survival. And it is a story of great sacrifice. The trauma lasted lifetimes. In British Guyana, it took generations before descendants of the first indentured laborers were able to get off the plantation, find work or own property of their own. And British colonizers didn't stop there. In Trinidad, British Guyana, and South Africa, the British inflamed tensions between formerly enslaved Africans and Indians, sowing divisions that continue to plague former colonies. So we are still able to see the legacies of colonialism to that extent that they are part of the politics in those countries still today. The indenture system didn't last forever. Indians in British colonies resisted their colonial oppressors for several decades. Although they didn't realize it, resistance efforts across the Indian diaspora culminated almost simultaneously in the early 1900s. In South Africa, individual workers rebelled on their plantations through desertion or suicide. Mahatma Gandhi later joined the Indian South African resistance movement, leading this major strike in 1913. In Fiji, indentured workers had the highest rates of suicide, using it as a form of resistance. 
In British Guyana, collective organizing ranging from demonstrations to resistance literature shook the nation. Some indentured workers took to writing in Guyanese newspapers to protest their abuse. I don't think that the British have, have ever apologized. There is a very violent way of erasing somebody's history without it seeming to be violent, which is just not to talk about it, just not to acknowledge it. Britain finally outlawed indentureship in 1917, but the system left behind a monumental legacy. Millions of South Asians were scattered across far corners of the world in a multi-generational Indian diaspora. Descendants of indenture in Suriname, Mauritius, British Guyana, and Trinidad cultivated a thriving Indo-Caribbean community. Indian South Africans launched their own political parties and joined in anti-apartheid efforts alongside Black South Africans. The coastal city of Durban, South Africa, became home to the largest population of Indians outside of India and is acclaimed for its Indian culinary scene. Assimilation was bittersweet for Indian migrants. They wanted to hold on to their cultural heritage, but colonial policies made this harder. In some places, it was punishable to speak Hindi. In others, Indians were not allowed to go to school or get jobs without first converting to Christianity. I am sure that every indentured family has stories like mine and I wish that we could just have some sense of you know the tragedy of it and also the remarkable nature of the people who survived it. Today indentured servitude may be a forgotten or even buried history but many of the tens of millions of descendants want us to know their story. 